at the home of Winston Groom, famous novelist, fiction writer, nonfiction. Most of us know him for writing The Amazing Forrest Gump, but we're going to have an interview with him, so come on in, follow me. Mr. Groom, how are you? Good to see you, Mr. Great Groom is my father. Oh, okay. Well, come in. Thank you very much. Welcome to Tuesdays with Dan. I'm here with uh, Winston Groom, a uh, famous novelist and also a fiction, nonfiction writer. You're about doing it all these days. I'm doing a lot of uh, history these days. I, I, I've seen that. And, uh, of course, I know that probably the most famous piece of work uh, is Forrest Gump. And we'll talk about that. But, you know, typically you're a Southern writer. And, um, well, a writer that lives in the South. I'm not a, necessarily a Southern writer. In other yeah. words, by that, I mean I don't write about Southern things all the sure, time. Sure, sure. And I knew you grew up in the Mobile area. What was it like growing up in, in that area? And how has it really affected uh, your sensibility as a writer? Well, yes, you know, it's, it's a medium-sized Southern city. And I think that I had a, a very normal uh, childhood. You know, my father was a lawyer, and my mother, for a while, taught English. She had her master's degree in Shakespeare, and so I got a dose of literature that way. And you know, I had a, a pretty good education, and then couldn't decide what I was going to do. I was in the army, and it, it just happened that I was in the army in the Vietnam era, and went to Vietnam. I'd been in the ROTC in, uh, in college and I got out, uh, escaped with my life, so to speak, in Vietnam and decided I wanted to be an editor because I'd been the editor of the College Humor magazine and I went to New York and you know, disabused of that notion very quickly. He said, you have to don't have any experience. So I said, well, where do you get experience? He said, well, go to the newspaper. I said, this is the last thing I want to do. But I wound up doing it anyway in, in Washington and spent a decade there almost. The Washington Star. The Washington Star, which is a great place. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that, that was an absolutely equal opportunity employer. I had Mary McGorry, one of the most liberal columnists in the country, on my left, <laughs> and Fred Barnes on my right, with you know, the Weekly Standard. And wow. so we, uh, we, everybody got along. It wasn't you know, uh, particularly a political uh, sure. animosities there. But I enjoyed it. I think that newspapers carry you through as a writer up to a certain extent, but I didn't want to stay there all my life. And I sort of looked at it when I got to be 30 years old and said, if I don't get out of here now, I'm gonna, I never will. Yeah. You know, you'll wind up with a mortgage and a house payment sure. and a car payment and so on. And so I just I did something I thought was probably the bravest thing I ever did. I resigned. And now I resigned, I resigned, I told them why. I said, I'm going to write a book. How, uh, what, who are some of your uh, chief literary uh, influences uh, in getting into writing? Who were you reading? Well, I was reading, actually, <laughs> it was the most remarkable thing. Um, I, when I went to New York, I first went to, out to the Hamptons, which was not in those days what it is now. Right. It was mostly writers, real writers and, and artists. With the leather elbows and the, the pipes yeah, yeah, and the well, real I mean, look, deal. Look, here's what you had out there. Here, I was writing a war book, right? All right. My friends were James Jones, who wrote From Here to Eternity in the Thin Red Line, Erwin Shaw, who wrote The Young Lions and Rich Man, Poor Man, Kurt Vonnegut with all oh. of his body of... Uh, 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 Joe Heller, who wrote Catch-22. They were all there. They're, yeah, they're all gone now, but they, they were... we. There was a great place out there called Bobby Vans. It's a restaurant. You get you a burger and a beer for like two dollars or something. And everybody go there for lunch. And um, th those people I just described, were, they'd be there practically every other day. I mean, John Knowles would be there. He wrote a separate piece. Uh, Betty Bacall, Lauren Bacall would be there, the actress. Adolph and Phyllis Green, the great uh, screen, I mean, uh, st uh, stage writers, musical writers. Um, I can't, I mean, just, you know, George Plimpton was there all the time. He was my very good friend, and Peter Matheson, who's still there. Uh, but it was like that every day. And you know, we, no, nobody sat around. Writers don't sit around and talk about writing, trust me. <laughs> One of my best friends was Willie Morris. And, and oh, God, we, we'd play pranks on each other. And this, I mean, it was, 
you know, it, but right as a human like anything else. I mean, they talk about baseball, money, and sex. Just being around that crowd gave me enough confidence to finish that book. Uh, I mean, I could see that it can be done. And I think that that was very, very important, uh, let alone just the, the friendship that was really uh, a, a, a remarkable thing amongst the writers out there. Everybody was friends. It would be a, a party every other night, right? Uh, even in the wintertime, mostly in the wintertime because it's so dull otherwise. Well, I, I know you had also mentioned, too, that you were in Vietnam. And uh, I know recently you've done a lot of work, nonfiction, about American war history. Yeah, and military you, history. And, and uh, with all of the work that you've been doing, um, have you always had a passion for American military history? Well, in, in a way, yeah. I, mean, I went to a military school, uh, Mobile UMS, it was called University Military School then. And uh, of course, I, my family, my father was in World War II. My grandfather in World War One, and I, actually, when I look back, I think that the, the, my family just had the bad luck of having sons come of age when they were to war. And I, I, of course, my great, both my great grandfathers were in the Civil War, and I had a great, 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 great grandfather who was in the War of 1812. He was a, a, a captain, and on the battlefield in the Battle of New Orleans, and Andrew Jackson. I gave him a battlefield commission as a major. Wow. Um, I have all the old papers from that era showing that. And so I've had a, a family interest, but I think having been in Vietnam uh, and experienced the war firsthand led me to, to look in retrospect at some of the other wars we fought. So I've written about just about every American war except the Korean War and, uh, and did, the Revolution. Did your, did your uh, experience, personal experience in the war, affect your writing later as a writer? Or? I, well, I, in, in a way, I, I, for instance, when I wrote A Storm in Flanders, which is about the, uh, actually the British mostly, in the First World War, and Flanders is a part of Belgium, and it was a horrible place, a million men died there, I mean died, let alone the ones who were wounded, it was just a, a terrible, dreadful place of mud and blood and sorrow, and the reason I chose that subject was but I had written about it, read about it before, and I thought I could never have gotten those guys uh, that I had to, was in charge of in Vietnam. They wouldn't have done it. They'd have killed me first. Right. And I said, I, I thought, well, how did they, the British and the Germans get those people to go through that? Um, and, and they did. And I finally concluded it was just a different age. Um, it, 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 it still astounds me sometimes. But I think that having been in a war, it, it, you, you know the parameters more uh, than somebody who writes about it from a purely academic standpoint. Yeah. And I, I, I know before I came here, we were, we were doing our research and I saw that uh, you know, a lot of, many people know you as a novelist, very successful novelist, but really for the past decade and a half, you've really been writing quite a bit on military history. Um, why the transition? Is it? Well, I'll tell you. Getting older, does that? I, that's part of it. I, it, it. Here's the way I look at it. <laughs> I say every writer has probably got one good book in them. If you're really lucky, you've got two. If you're extremely lucky, you've got three. Now, there are exceptions to that. Dickens is one comes to mind. Okay. But then you start looking at, at what, what happens is that they don't know what else to do. They keep on writing. So you wind up like uh, Thomas Wolfe and Fitzgerald. They drank themselves to death at the age of 30 or 40, whatever it was. Or Hemingway blows his brains out. I mean, I didn't want to go down that path. I'm telling you, sure. look, I've got, I've got two or three good books, I think, out of all. I've written, what, 18 books now, I think. And I, tr I said, I, I want to try a, a, a Civil War history. And I, uh, a friend of mine uh, who ran Atlantic Monthly uh, said, yeah, let's try it. And it was very successful, and I enjoyed right. doing it. And, I mean, the good thing about writing history is, unlike a novel where you just got a blank 
piece of paper you put it or however you do it in the computer. You know, history's got a beginning and middle and end. It's there. You just got to right. fill in the blanks. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've sort of carved out a little niche there. Um, you know, the first book is always difficult. Most, most, uh, you're not going to set the world on fire writing history books like you do with, say, Forrest Gump. Yeah. Uh, but you will create a following. And I get the letters and all that, and I, I like that. You know, I, I, I find it interesting to do. Well, you're certainly the authority to be able to write these books with your history and personally serving in Vietnam. Uh, I wanted to take a short break, and then when we want to come back, I wanted to talk to you about the famous Forrest Gump a little bit, and then we want to find out <laughs> what you're doing now. Uh, we'll be right back with more with uh, Winston Groom in a minute. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for coming back. We're here with Winston Groom. Uh, Winston, I wanted to ask you a little bit. I know that the, the, the Forrest Gump is, is probably the, the body of work that's gotten the most accolades. I mean, it was, it, when it turned to film, I think it was about a billion dollar film. Is that right? I mean, yeah, it was just it massive. World, worldwide, it wound up. In fact, I know we were talking about it earlier how many times I've seen it, and you said, well, heck, it's on tonight. <laughs> so yeah. it's, but I, I was going to ask you a little bit about your inspiration for, for, for that film. What were, what were some of your... Uh, well, it, 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 there's no Forrest Gump. I mean, sure. I'd like a character or something. But what, I, I was living in New York back in the 80s, and I was coming back here to see my father. who's was quite old. He was an attorney here in Mobile. And, uh, I was having lunch with him one day, and he started to reminisce about growing up. And, oh, he was born in 1908. So, uh, you know, he, he grew, grew up in old downtown Mobile, and uh, there was a young boy in his neighborhood who was what they then call retarded and the kids would chase him and tease him and throw sticks at him and so forth and one day this young boy's mother bought a piano and they saw it being moved in the house and within two days this gorgeous piano music i'm wafting out of that house and the young man it was a genius um, and i recognized that is, with 60 minutes had just done a show. It's an idiot savant syndrome. Right. Where, you know, you, your, your mind is such as you can't tie your own shoes, but you can do amazing mathematical sure. uh, calculations. Or you can them. have musical, you know, that sort of thing. And so the kids in the neighborhood decided, well, they, they were going to take this young boy under their wing then. And I thought, yeah, that's a nice story. I got home, and I thought, I'm going to make some notes about this, and maybe I could use it somewhere as a scene sure. in a book. And by... You know, late that night, I had the first chapter of Forrest Gump written wow. on it. And I, I see, was there some kind of also personal things kind of pulled in as well? Because I know in Forrest Gump, they had the, the military experience over in Nam, and then I saw he was the big, you know, college football was worked in there, which I know you're a huge <laughs> Crimson Tides fan. Uh, was yeah, there well, you write about what you know about. Sure. And, and, you know, I had actually... It's interesting you brought up the, the football part of it because you know, you got a guy who's got an IQ of 69 or something, 60. Uh, yeah. uh, there's no way he's going to play football in Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I figured that as I wanted him to do great things, and I'm figuring if I if the reader will go with me, if they'll believe that, if they'll believe that, that the guy with a with a uh, mind like Forrest Gump can play foot, college football, he can do anything. I've got the yeah. reader. And so, of course, in the book, I had him, he was an astronaut, and he was all sorts of things. Yeah. And appeared in, you know, all these scenes. So that, I, I, I figured if I could make that realistic enough in the story, that the reader would, they, they, they'd allow possible. me this, it, it followed me through the rest of the book. Otherwise, yeah. I'm going to lose them. Well, you certainly accomplished that. We, we definitely believed it. And when you were writing the book, did you know, like, internally, okay, this is going to be a phenomenon. This is going to be a major thing. Or did you just think, this is a good book, but I've written many books? I didn't know what in the hell to think about it. I, I got through with it, and I, my gut feeling was, this is something. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't even tell my agent about it. I sent it to Willie Morris, uh, who at that point was the uh, writer in residence at Ole Miss. And I said, asking him, would you look at this? Tell me what you think. I think Willie is probably the best editor in America at that point. You know, he'd been the editor of Harper's and so forth, but sure. Harper's was really big. And, and I didn't hear anything for about two weeks. And I got a phone call about midnight one night. And it simply said, don't change a word. And he, I, he loved it. 
And I, that was a great feeling because I always pump. looked up at, to Willie as a mentor. And um, so I sent it to my agent, and he sold it like that. And the movies bought it in manuscript form. And it took a while to make it, but um, it just, it's one of those things that, it literally wrote itself. I don't know how to describe it, but I mean, I think it came, it, it wasn't cerebral. It comes from what I call a lizard brain, which is back here in the back of your neck. And the thoughts just go right through this brain and onto these 10 fingers and onto the keys without going through the right. process. And I, I, Joe Hell once told me that Catch-22 wrote itself for him. And I don't know whether to believe him or not, but <laughs> I know that Gump did, and I, it never happened before, and I don't think it'll happen again. But it was quite a, it was a ride, I'll tell you that. Well, and I know they say if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. And certainly I know that's probably true with you. you I could just see talking with you, you love writing. That beats a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it's, you know, I, I do it when I want to do it, but it's a discipline. You got to, you, you I do it every it. day. It's a job. And uh, you, you, I approach it as a job. I don't have writer's block. I got over that about the first day at the newspaper. Uh, you didn't tell the city editor you got to write his block if you're on a deadline. You got a triple axe murder. You know, right. You just do it. You write through it and you fix it later. Well, I want to talk about some of the new books. I know you've been very busy. Last year you, you wrote a, a book. This year so far you've put out two books. But and I know obviously everybody talks about Forrest Gump. But uh, is there a particular body of work? I mean, I know you now have 18 books published. Is there a particular body of work that you're the most proud of, or that's personal to you? Well, let's put it this way. It, if you had 18 kids, yeah. well, you know, you, you you're, proud of, you're proud of them for, for every one of them is different. That's right. And, and uh, <laughs> you love them for what they are. I mean, some of them you wish to turn out a little better. Uh, some of them you're extremely proud of. But I don't, not, not really. I mean, you know, my fiction is, that's, it is what it is. And the same with the, with the uh, military histories. They, the, I've developed a, a following. They seem to like it, um, the way I do it, uh, which is a little bit different from the way some other people do it. And I, I, my main thing about I, I, I enjoy it. I, it's not easy all the time, yeah. but I, I know, I, I, I'm experienced enough to know I'm going to get there. I right. know where the light at the end of the tunnel yeah. is. I'm just, at, you know, sometimes at the far end of the tunnel. Yeah. But I can get there, and I, I just I enjoy doing it. And certainly the joy transfers uh, in your writing. Tell us uh, for a second a little bit about uh, Carney. Is it Carney's March? Carney's March. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's spelled Carney, yeah, but it's I, pronounced Irish. Pronounce it Carney. That yeah. that is something that actually was I got to it by accident. I was looking up General uh, Phil Carney, um, who's a Civil War general. And I realized when I got there, I said, I got the wrong Kearney. Right. <laughs> and I, I got another Kearney. It was an 1840s uh, Kearney. And the, the headline on the paragraph said, Kearney's March. And I thought, you know, that's a nice title for a book. I like that. What was it all about? So I looked at it and, of course, discovered that during the, the uh, Mexican War, Kearney uh, marched out of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas with 2,000 troopers known as the Army of the West to go down to Santa Fe Trail to Santa Fe and take Santa Fe um, during the war. And he did that. And then he further marched all the way to California, which had never been done. I mean, there weren't even any maps back in 1846. And he marched out there and, and got in a big fight and got a bunch of people killed, but wound up taking California. And we still got it. We're not going to give it back. I know you also wrote a book uh, on Ronald Reagan. I did. Which is just amazing to me. He was a really amazing guy. And uh, what do you think the viewers would be the most surprised with reading your book about, about Ronald Reagan? Well, I tell you, it's a book. It, it, it's something I did as a labor of love because it's for young adults. And I think that young people, say 13 to 18, 17, they, they get a dose of politics every day. Right. But in school, they're not taught anything. They're taught maybe up to Roosevelt as a president. They know a little bit about Jefferson and Washington and Lincoln, but none of the modern presidents. And uh, so we got to talking about it one day, and I said, you know, somebody ought to write some of the books for these people. And I said, Reagan would be great for me. I mean, other people could do other people. 
I think that the, one of the, uh, Reagan is almost a Horatio Alger story. I mean, his childhood, the writing for, for young people, he came from an extremely disadvantaged childhood. And he was so poor, he didn't even know he was poor until he got to college. <laughs> That's poor. That's poor. <laughs> and, and, but everything he did, he did right. I mean, he, he, he couldn't play football. He said, you're too small, you can't see. He proved him wrong. He was a captain of the football team in, in high school and in college. He acted in college. He was a president of the Student Government Association in college. Then he got out right in the middle of the Depression, at the height of it, 1931 or two, and he wound up getting a job as a sports announcer by a fluke. Uh, he talked his way into it because he could he was fast on his feet and uh, wound up being a voice of the Chicago Cubs, and that got him out to Los Angeles because the owner of the Cubs, Wrigley, owned Catalina Island oh. where they. He, uh, he had a, a spring training. Oh yeah. That's, what, that's how he got to California. Uh, Avalon. And then, yeah, wow. and that's how he got to uh, to Hollywood. Wow, I didn't know and that. He parlayed that, and then he, he, meantime, was a lieutenant in the army in the reserves. And of course, World War II comes along. They grab him up, and they put him in charge of, of some fairly sophisticated stuff that had to do with films. And he came back, and he became the. Um, he had the Screen Actors Guild, and at that point, the communists trying to take it over. So he, yeah, I mean, was, he, he had this sort of charmed life, and he, he was a man of good spirit, good humor. He, I think he's, I never met him. I met every president since Kennedy, hmm. except Reagan. Is that and right? He's the only one I said I really would have liked to have met him because he seemed like probably a good guy. Yeah. Tell me real brief about the book out now, uh, Civil War, uh, Shiloh, 1862. Uh, I know that's a pretty recent book. It's about the Battle of Shiloh, which was the first major battle in the Civil War. I mean, the first battle of the Civil War was Bull Run, uh, where they, they had, I think, 4,000 uh, casualties. And everybody thought that was horrible. And the next <laughs> thing you know, two or three months later, they have Shiloh, where there's 24,000 casualties. And people then began to realize that what they had created here was a monster, that this was an enormous, this, this was going to be, the country was going to be drenched in blood for years and years. It wasn't any sort of quick military victory that was going to end the war in 1862 or 1863 or 1864. It was going to go on and on, and it, it was a shock on both sides, and I tried to make the point that if the women of the South had risen up, they wouldn't, you know, they, they, that, that's when the, that war should have stopped. They should have said, look, we're Let's, let's, let's rethink this, but they did because it was too late, and he didn't. They had to fight it out. Yeah. But Shiloh was the catalyst that it, it really told him that this, this was going to be a long war. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Let me ask one final question. I, you know, eventually when you lay down your pen and and you, you've done, you've gotten every all the books out of you, and you lay down <laughs> your pen. What do you really? Uh, you've accomplished so much over the, you know, past few decades. What do you What do you want your your legacy to be? Well, I don't think I'm ever going to lay down the pen purposely, I think, because I enjoy it too much. But I, I just, I, I like for people to, to, you know, 500 years from now, to like, say, hey, this tells me something. I like this. And it's this guy, I can relate to this guy as a writer, and I know more now that i finished this book than I did before I started it, and I appreciate the effort. That's all you can ask for. Yeah, well, I think you certainly have accomplished that. I think people for years and years and years will be talking about the mark that you've left uh, uh, with writers, and certainly we all have look to you. I, I'm actually not a writer. I'm an entrepreneur that writes, and as you mentioned, I'm learning right now the discipline that it takes to do what you do. Uh, certainly amazing. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. it's been a real pleasure, and we appreciate you inviting us into your home. Um, thank you very much, guys. That's our show. We're out of time. I wanted to, again, thank our spe very special guest, Winston Groom. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and remember to get involved in your local communities and be forgiving of others. Shop local. Good night, everybody.